Uh, yeah, my my question is, um, I think fairly straightforward. It, I know what we've <laughs> what we've talked about so far is um, kind of the ideal of what our morning services would be like and, and our daily services at home. But in the real world, some days are more rushed than other days. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are on if if you don't have a half hour to go through the, the full service and do it properly and give it the attention that it requires, um, is there a shortened version that would be kind of more essential on those um, days that are overloaded? Yeah, so first of all, that's a really good question. Uh, and actually it's something, this, this has to, you know, when we think about Buddhist practice, especially our practice of Gongu, our practice of uh, chanting the Daimoku. When you talk to people on what, when, when somebody teaches you about that point, on, on what basis are they teaching you? Uh, just give you some idea about what I wanted to know, that's not proper. I wanted to understand what do we base our practice on? What is our practice based on? And if we look at the idea of like Ayurvedic teaching, the idea as far as we say for this, uh, this meeting is for health and wellness. So how do we build, and we know through health and wellness, one of the most important thing is, is a kind of standard. But how do we start that? Usually when we meet Buddhism or uh, practice or spiritual practice, we just get the whole package. We get like a little package that says, this is the meaning of this, this is the meaning of that. We spend a lot of time maybe studying words, meanings, etc. But I wanted to ask simply, how do you start? That I could meet somebody and teach them how to practice within five minutes. Okay. Simply, and this is the core and basis that we should always build, like a nice building, build it on, is that idea of dinacharya. Dinacharya means a kind of practice uh, that is a consistent practice. So most important is in order to understand, well, we first have to understand what our goal is. Our goal is kanjin, which is our kind of samadhi, right? Our awakening, stopping and seeing our mind. If that is our goal, where do we start? So in order to move towards that, the most important rules that I teach people is that Consistency is important, right? Consistency and uh, uh, maybe that same thing, but uh, like for instance, be consistent in your practice. Even if it is just five minutes a day, be consistent with five minutes. That's why you should never have a, a reason why you can't practice. But the way that's why when people teach gongyo to people, they teach this 20, 30 minute practice that even when you, I remember the first time I did gongyo, should only take about 20 minutes, right? But actually it took me maybe one hour and a half or something when I first tried to start Nichiren in Buddhism. It took me a long time because I didn't know how to chant in Japanese and all that stuff, you know? And it's important to do it at the same time every day and consistently. That is where you start to gain some kind of uh, ritual or habit. So we're, we're trying to invoke in ourselves the habit of a bodhisattva, right? We want to be bodhisattvas. We want to be in the bodhisattva mindset. That means a bodhisattva is consistent and stable. So actually, I would prefer people to do five minutes consistently rather than even 20 minute service. That's why I don't know why they teach that much because actually people see when you come to the temple, that's how people participate together. But when you come to the temple, you know you're going to be there probably more than five minutes, right? So therefore that is a group practice. But how about the individual practice? Has anyone ever taught you those things? No, they don't. They just, you think that the individual, the group practice is the individual practice, but it's not. So we as leaders and as practitioners, most important is teach a habit of Daimoku. So therefore, even you wake up in the morning and uh, offer the water, 
That is a habit. Put the hands in gosho and incense. That is a habit. If you can do that consistently uh, for uh, three, one or two months, you'll notice some change. But what Nyosho was talking about, I understood because I also, even when I was training to do the service, uh, we, we have different priorities. We think we're busy all the time. Well, that's where your mind is now, and that's okay. Because what these kind of habit changes, your mind hasn't, your mind and body has not been convinced of what is healthy for you. Because we go towards what helps us deal with life, right? So we have our habits, and that, that's how we've been able to sustain kind of equilibrium. So we don't, again, just like I was saying, we don't have the right context to understand the equilibrium of the Buddha or the equilibrium of the Bodhi Bodhisattva. But we can experience that in our daily life. How? Through the beginning of practice. So if we consistently commune with the Buddha, with our Buddha mind, even offering flower, even offering water, incense and gasho, that instills in ourselves some experiential understanding. So therefore, I'll tell you how it works for me. I decided, you know, even though I was a priest, I was going to remove all of, because I chant the whole Yoho, which is all the highlighted chapters, right, in the morning. But I wanted to remove all of that and even rebuild my practice. So I removed all of that, went back to the most simple practice of offering incense, water, and chanting the Daimoku three times. And then I consistently watched, because even at that point, I have to admit, it was a chore to chant, right? So I never thought, I thought, okay, this is the, just me against my ego, right? Or I'm just not disciplined. But actually, that is not sustaining. Because sooner or later, you, your body is trying to, in a way, and your mind is trying to self-preservation and to be happy to find that goal that we want we don't know what it is like happiness or contentment or whatever but just to keep a kind of balance in our life equilibrium so sometimes people use smoking sometimes drink or go out or sense whatever it is those are now your priorities but when we introduce a new one we have to demonstrate to our body and mind its worth and then we have to experientially understand that in that moment, we, we, we understand, how do you say, the serenity that we gain from it. And then from there, our body, instead of fighting us, will go along with it very easily. And then you can start adding other practices. Then naturally, the other things in your life that you thought were more important are not as important. So my spiritual practice in the morning I will pick over anything, money or anything, but I had to build it that I, my body and mind and spirit understood and experienced its value. If I just started doing 20 minutes, that is hard work. Our, my body rejected that. My mind rejected that because it stressed you out. You can get stressed out from practice too, but that's not what the goal is. Our goal is to gain equilibrium. We have to, uh, we're working with a few aspects of ourselves. It's not just convincing your mind or mind over matter type thing where I'm going to practice because I think this is good for me. If that was the case, we wouldn't have New Year's resolutions. We wouldn't have all those self-help books. We just automatically would be able to change ourselves to being able to do what we consider good for ourselves. But how many people here come across or come against themselves going, I choose something else over your practice, like a walk in the park. Because to you, that's common. Your body has said, I like walking in the park. It calms me down. Meditation stressed me out, right? Meditation is forcing me to do something that's uncomfortable. You, you cannot train the body and mind and spirit that way to understand that it is, uh, you have to, how do you say, convince those aspects of yourself that it is uh, useful. But if you force it, it won't work. If you force it, it won't work. That's why telling somebody to go home and do a whole gongyo every day, morning and evening is a recipe for disaster. 
No one will do it. I didn't do it when I became a new chair of this. So then what you do is that that's why you have a Buddhist teacher. You can work and add certain ritual in the morning because actually in the morning, really essential because in the morning, as soon as you wake up, how many people hear their mind starts racing and worrying, right? So how do you overcome that? This is a dinacharya, is a ritual. That's the purpose of ritual. That from the moment you wake up, for instance, in uh, Ayurveda, took me a while. Like, for instance, I'll tell you, it's kind of gross, but that's the way we're talking about humans, so we're kind of gross as it is. How to purify your body when you wake up by removing all waste, right? That means being able to go bath to the bathroom and remove all the waste. Most people can't do that because they're so uptight. Takes them a few hours to mellow out, then they can go to the restroom. It took me a long, it took me a little while to be able to do that upon waking up. But actually, you can train yourself to do that. And then when I realized, oh, I feel lighter, I feel better, my body accepted it. Now my body does it without thinking about it. Then I added, you know, adding oil or washing my face or however I do according to my dinacharya. Clean my nose, you know, once uh, with not the uh, neti pot. Once a, once a month, etc. Once every couple of weeks, those things I added on very little by little. Then my body now it, it doesn't it doesn't uh, I don't wake up with uh, what do you call it? Uh, not annoyance, but like uh, agitation or thinking or overstimulated mind. I wake up and then I do my ritual, and then I prepare the rest of my day. So my body says, you need this. This is top priority. So I don't even have to think about it. Anymore. And then it became kind of long. So I do the yoga. Then I do the prepare the body as I was showing the different practices, the asana. Then I do chanting. Then I do with the, with the meditation. Then I do in the service. I do this uh, meditation and service, chanting. That's my practice. But it took a while for my body and mind to go, okay, this is proper way. My Buddha nature then became, I, I realize it's, that's why I talk about nourishing your Buddha nature. Your Buddha nature knows what you need to do. But right now, the strongest thing that we do, especially in the West, is our mind. We don't even emotionally mature as much as other countries. We don't have as high education in our, because we have everything we want we, we, get, we, we just use our mind thinking that that's the existence in the world. That's how we look at the world. In other countries, that's why in the Shugendo mountain training, this is no use so much in the mountain. This is used in the mountain, is a, a heart or emotional part. So actually in the most, how do you say, culture, like Western or very developed countries are kind of sad because all they do is have in their head other part is very underdeveloped. So therefore, lots of psycho lots of uh, problems, emotional problems in, in a high, what do you call it, uh, modern society, because we don't emotionally mature. Then if we look at the idea of Buddha nature, how do you mature Buddha nature? Does anyone know? How do you gain, how do you nourish your Buddha nature? Just you, you think about that, nourishing your Buddha nature or wishing? You have to work at it. You have to work at it, learning and practicing. That's why without learning and practicing, there is no Buddhism. That's what Nietzsche and Shonen said. That's essential why Shohoji Sosho is so important. So learning and practicing allows us to nourish our Buddha nature. But many of you don't even know your Buddha nature is there, do you? Have, do you have anyone here realized their Buddha nature? That you can say, what is your Buddha nature and what is your mind? What is your ego? You can see the difference. Okay, good. If that's the case, then it's working for you. But how to nourish that and then for your body, for your Buddha nature to go, okay, I'm in charge rather than your mind, rather than your emotion. Your Buddha nature is in charge. That's the idea of a Bodhisattva. That's the idea of a Buddha. We have all the other minds, 
but the Buddha mind is the most unnourished one because nothing in this world can uh, nourish that one. We have to practice and study to nourish that one. That's what the Chivin Shonen said. Then naturally you will you will have a proclivity. That's the one thing I have to say really bothered me about Buddhism. I didn't have a proclivity. I knew Buddhism was good, just like eating healthy, right? But how many people, even knowing what eating healthy is, eat healthy? Actually, being from New York, I find great solace in beer and uh, chicken wings. My wife, too, if she's angry with me, that's the only way to calm her down. She likes them, so. Easier than buying a diamond ring or something like that. But, you know, that's how we have a kind of oil that reminds me of something that's so important because I experienced that. That has something already planted in my mind. It brings me to a happy place. But how about Buddhism? Most people practice Buddhism, and Buddhism is obnoxious to them, not joyful experience. Most people think Buddhism is a chore. Oh, I have to do service because I said I'm a Buddhist, so if I, I got to do this. That, that is not the way to practice Buddhism. If that's your way, that means you are forcing Buddhism to yourself. That is not the growing your Buddha nature. That is just growing your resentment. Because your mind doesn't like to, like the wild ox doesn't like to be tamed. It likes to do its own thing. Right? The body likes to do its own thing. But we have to convince those things and also to develop that bigger mind that uh, it can overregulate the other minds. It can control the other minds. So as we know in Ichin and Sanzen, all the minds contain the other nine, right? So Buddha mind is in all of them. So if we grow the Buddha mind, we can regulate our hell mind. But if you don't, if you just have a hell mind, all of your minds are regulated by hell mind or by the gaki mind. So that's why it's essential to grow and nourish the Buddha nature. But my question was how? Learning and practicing. That is the idea of more in your daily life. When you wake up, go to Buddha, wash your mouth, wash your face, go to the Buddha, light incense, ring the bell, Put the water and chant the Dai Moka three times. If you can do that consistently, you will look forward because of look at the Buddha, very pleasing. Then you realize, oh, I'm not as stressed out or anxiety as I have in the morning. That was the word anxiety. I had terrible anxiety in the morning, terrible anxiety, crippling anxiety. Couldn't get out of bed sometimes. But I look forward to going to see the Buddha. I look forward to doing my practice because I know. I can then be more balanced to, to take on to that, that mind becomes stronger over the other one. But just to force yourself and to force others to do a 20 minute service is ridiculous. It's not going to work. It's going to make them resent the practice and then go, they're going to fall out of it anyhow. So that's why traditionally, if you ask the Buddhist teacher, he can teach you according to your understanding. So when you offer those things in the morning, then you can come to your teacher and say, Sensei, I really experienced looking at the Buddha's face, how beautiful, and looking at the mandala, seeing the Buddha. Just looking at your Buddhist shrine is inspiring. It should be inspiring. Otherwise, you know, why are you a Buddhist? Right? Buddha is your teacher. You should greet the Buddha in Chen and Shana every morning. That's why we are inspired by that. Actually, in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, right? There are the A, B, C. So first A, this is the way that they look at the mind. A is the activating event. So that means all the events going on in your life, right? Things you like, things you don't like. Then the B is the kind of behavioral response. Then C is the, uh, uh, like a conclusion or a result, right? Consequence. So therefore, it's very difficult to change external activating events or consequence. Those are very difficult to come to terms and change because we're, we're ignorant. We don't see things properly. We see like a must. They call it masturbation, 
The world must be great and like me or else I'm no good. You must approve of me or else I'm no good. Everything must be fair to me or else it's no good. You know, those must things. But we can change up our outlook. That's why to change your philosophy, to change your outlook can profoundly change your life. That is why people's lives have been changed, changed by many spiritual practices. That's what all spiritual practices are meant to do, is to change one's behavioral response. Because that means you change your outlook on life. So therefore, you're looking through the eyes of a Buddha rather than just as a suffering being. So do, we can profoundly change our life by simply looking at the Buddha, simply looking into the spiritual world, wherever you're at. That can profoundly, profoundly change one's life. Because we have people here with lots of different spiritual backgrounds, right? All profoundly change your life because you, you gravitate towards that. But what is it? It's that connection. That's where it starts. That's why we become disciples of the Buddha. That's why we take refuge under the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. So when we simply, people think it has to be complicated, but Buddhism doesn't have to be complicated. It can simply be wishing to see the Buddha with all of your life, with all of your heart, even at the cost of your life. What does that feel like? Well, actually, you can learn that by seeing the Buddha. Because actually, whenever you then have a problem, what do you go back? You go back to see the Buddha. You go to your spiritual book, right? You go to your spiritual book. That's how it's supposed to work. Because something in your life changes. But you understand that this is OK. This is a why we take refuge. It's a safe place. We go to our safe place. That's in our spiritual practice. So. That is the same as the seeing, like as uh, in Judaism, to see the Torah, right? Right, to see the art. That's important. Same idea. We go to see the Buddha. We see the Buddha. We see Nichiren and Shonen. And actually, that's why Buddhist statues are so profound, because I can look at the Buddha's face and something, not like any other religious statue, they don't do anything for me too much. I mean, they're beautiful, but. Something in the Buddha and Nietzsche and Shonen's face changes my outlook about everything. Gives me direction, gives me hope, gives me faith. Then I can move closer to that through practice. Then it's easier to add little by little. But if you do it by yourself, you will end up corrupting like everything else. Right? Because if we could, if we could dig ourselves out, we would do that all. But that's why Buddhism has the idea. Somebody was saying online, you don't need the Sangha, don't need the teacher, don't need any of that stuff. If that was the case, we can run our lives however we think. But actually, I don't think we're practicing Buddhism. Right? We're just practicing whatever we think is Buddhism. But did that ever help me? No. That never helped me until I met my teacher. Because he was on the path. Because I didn't know what the path was. He had been on the path longer than I had. So he could tell me and try to instill in me what the path is, because that's why Buddhism is a path that we're looking, but we can't see the, the forest for the trees where we, we don't know what the path looks like. We're thinking that, oh, it should be a clear road, not so clear. Because actually Buddhism is very difficult. What is enlightenment? You don't know, but you want it, right? What's Buddhist path? What is Buddhist prayer? You don't know, but you want to do it. That's very difficult to think you're going to accomplish something that you don't know anything about. The only way you can know that is by seeing the example. That's why we have the Buddha and Nichiren Shonen. They demonstrate for us how to walk the path of Buddha, the Buddhist path. So that starts in the morning when you wake up. What is your priority? And also Buddhism is a priority. What is your priority? Should be to see the Buddha, Nichiren and Shonen. Then you can see in your daily life, oh, today I forgot to see the Buddha, Nichiren and Shonen. How do I feel? Sometimes I would feel strange, you know? Then I would have to go find the Buddha and see the Buddha. Then I made sure 
I went back to do it. Then it found value for me. Then I was able to do it. But just throwing me into doing service and saying this is a good thing for you is not, not at all effective. So I'm just real with people because I don't want to pretend to be a Buddhist. I didn't choose Buddha. I did. I chose to be a Buddhist because I could experientially understand it. I didn't need somebody to just tell me it was a good thing or promise me a good thing or tell me that it would help me in the next life or any of these things. I wanted to understand it in reality. And that's what I want to teach my students. I want to answer those questions sincerely. I don't want to just sit because I already went to Shingyo Dojo and I should know. No, not necessarily at all. So that's why I even went back and revamped my own practice because I said, since I'm not feeling it, since I'm not experientially understanding its benefit, something's wrong with the system I was being given. So I went back and studied through many teachers about the traditional style of Buddhism. And this is the traditional way. Because actually, when Buddhism spread, it spread through the image of the Buddha. People would see Buddha and be inspired themselves. They would see their own face in the Buddha. Then be inspired to become, oh, because we can't see our Buddha nature, right? But this is another question. How do you know Buddha nature exists? Does anyone know? Does anyone know that Buddha nature exists? Can they tell me how they see it? No? I'm not a Buddha. I don't know what Buddha nature is. You guys know what Buddha nature is? Yeah, I don't know. How do we see Buddha nature? The way of the Bodhisattva. How do we realize what a Bodhisattva is? We have to see a Bodhisattva to understand what is a Bodhisattva. This is a transmission, demonstration. We see that in each and Shonen's life. That is our demonstration. That's why we read each and Shonen's Gosho. Try to get an idea of his mind. But he always directs us back to the Lotus Sutra. What's the goal of the Lotus Sutra? Does it say specifically what the goal is? It says to cause all living beings to attain a life. That's why we look at chapter 16. But actually, if you read the whole sutra, sometimes it says it's a teaching without a teaching. It doesn't tell you exactly how to go about it. It just tells you, tries to give you some insight to what it is. Nichiren Shonen transmitted that through the Daimoku to us. That's the great example of the Bodhisattva, the how to practice by upholding the sutra. That's the essential aspect. Okay, any questions? Did that answer your question, Yosho? Because I'm sorry, I went on a tangent. I just, you know, there's a lot of questions, a lot of issues I was dealing with too. It was a beautiful tangent that you went on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, uh, it thoroughly answered questions that I have for myself and, and questions that I've had in terms of how do I help others who are um, really at a very beginner stage. And so I appreciate your answer very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just bring them to greet the Buddha. That's yeah. it. Bring them to greet the Buddha. And when they greet the Buddha, they will be inspired. Something, that's why I know Buddha nature is real. Because actually, when I was younger, and when I was a monk, somebody said to me, Oh, aren't you offended? Like if you did that to other religious statues, maybe they're offended. The Buddha, like people put in their um, yard or somewhere else in their house, etc. People offend. Why aren't Buddhists offended by that? Because actually, I asked. I went to the board, the really conservative Christian house, and they had the Buddha in the garden. And I said, "You're conservative Christian. That is an idol to you." No, 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 that is a Buddha. He makes me very happy. He's wonderful. I love my Buddha. See, that has nothing to do with the religion because that has to do with, they identify with the Buddha. That's why the Buddha's image is really important because Buddha doesn't seem like a religious leader. It just seems like a peaceful being, like the kind of guy you want to hang out with, right? And show you a good peaceful time, right? Not get you into trouble. 
And then also you get to hang out in all these beautiful places. Usually they never put Buddha on the shrine by itself. Usually people with their instinctual put it in the garden or outside. But usually religion is very stale. Put in a sacred place, don't touch all of that. But actually Buddha is amongst the trees and the bushes and all of that. And people wear their t-shirts with the Buddha and wear Buddhist bracelets. They don't know why. I think to me, I said, somebody said, are you a fan? I said, no, no. That is proves they have a Buddha nature because it instinctively happens, not forced, not convinced, no doctrine, no nothing. Just they innately know Buddha is wonderful, Buddha is peace, Buddha is calmness. That's that Buddha nature, our original nature identifying with that. So just bring people to meet the Buddha. The Buddha nature then will develop on its own. That's the wonderful thing about Buddhism. It's uh, innovative, non-invasive surgery. You don't have to change your face or your hairdo or anything to be a Buddhist practitioner, right? We don't have to give you a facelift or anything like that, right? But you can just practice Buddhism as it is, even just by respect the Buddha. They did, uh, did anyone ever see in LA where they were having lots of crime? The Vietnamese Buddhists built the Buddhist shrine there and then the crime dropped quite a lot. There's an article online. Did anyone see that one? So there's an article, I think it was in LA. Some Buddhist, there was an area that was drug dealing and crime and that. So they built in a small kind of meridian, the Buddhist shrine. And no one destroyed Buddhist shrine, no one did anything. And then that place became very peaceful. So they said, why did that happen? Because just to put the Buddha there was to cause people to become peaceful. Very interesting. Look it up uh, online. There's a couple examples of it. I think it was a Vietnamese uh, immigrants that did that. So I, I do understand that the, uh, there's differences between um, Japanese culture and Buddhist culture. Uh, could you explain in some, you know, like with a few examples, what Buddhist culture culcates or what Buddhist culture is? Good question. You know, I, I remember going to Japan and I, I, again, I, my nature is to kind of, I really want to know I don't want to pretend anything. So I remember going to Japan and a Japanese person said to me, ah, because I was wearing the monk pose. Oh, you love Japanese culture. And I thought for a second and I said, so that's why you like a Buddhism. But I said, no, actually I'm Buddhist. So this is my culture. I don't, I don't, you know, Japanese, just because you're Japanese, it's kind of ignorant for me to just think you're Buddhist. So just you're Japanese doesn't mean you're Buddhist, right? There's a Japanese Shinto, Japanese Christian, Japanese Jewish, anything we have. But doesn't mean you are Buddhist. Buddhism is a culture that influences other cultures. So Buddhism culture influenced Japanese culture. Uh, if you look back to the the first emperor in that, that that brought the Buddhism, he uh, he actually became kind of a saint in Buddhism. The constitution or law in Japan is based on the Lotus Sutra. is based on Buddhism. That was what they established the Japanese government on, was on the Buddhist teaching at that time. Uh, so therefore, what is the difference? I think. When you look at Japanese culture, okay, and again, even Buddhist culture, what is Buddhism? Buddhism, when we go even further back before Buddhism, there is the Vedic culture, right? Buddha wasn't a Vedic practitioner. He was he grew up in that culture. The Vedic teaching has a lot of influence into Buddhism. Then the Buddhism influenced China, Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, South, you know, all of those places with a teaching of Buddhism. Buddhism has its own flavor, 
and what are they? Well, uh, that's something that you have to inculcate little by little. That's why you have a teacher to learn. So one of the biggest things that I learned about Buddhism was consideration. That means a Buddhist is very considered because that's a Bodhisattva mindset. So for years, that's why Komoto Sensei would say, lack of consideration. That's it. Because you might think you're a considerate person, but most of the time you're probably considerate for yourself, first and first priority. But as a Bodhisattva, you have to be considerate of others. Right? That is very basic. And then also, value system is different. Even one's, uh, how do you say, liberation is different. Other religion, liberation of self is very important. But actually, Buddhism, liberation of all beings is the top priority. So it's interesting because then it says, okay, the self is not so important in Buddhism. And I mean, Buddhist culture, that's right. So for a Westerner, when you think about self, you think you're the most important person where we've been taught that. But actually in Buddhist culture, that's very strange. Lack of consideration. That's why in, in Buddhist culture, sometimes you'll see the idea of the group mentality rather than the individualist mentality. The whole group has to agree. That's based on the concepts of the Buddhist Sangha. Because when you join the Sangha, when you join, when you take refuge in the Buddha, there are rules. We were talking about that today. People just think, oh, just Buddhism is anything goes. There has to be an idea of in and out of Sangha. What does it mean to be in Buddhism and what does it mean not to be in Buddhism? Very different. Then through practice, through our teaching, we can gain the culture of Buddhism. And that culture of Buddhism then assimilates into your this culture. So originally the Japanese didn't believe in Buddhism. They were animists, right? So they had multiple deities, etc. Uh, and some, you know, the very, very basic animism, worship of nature. To bring Buddhism, then gave them the perspective of Buddhism must have been very strange for them. Because then Buddhist culture grew around that, which then what we think about the what Japanese may think is Japanese culture is actually influenced heavily by Buddhist culture. It's not Japanese culture. Because Buddhism is expressed in the culture, in your culture, in your daily life. So therefore, that's why we have the idea of adding a time or appreciation, why we take refuge, why we bow. I know even in the martial arts, when I teach the class, we bow to the founder. Some people don't have a problem with that. I don't want to bow to anything or anyone else. Sorry, but they don't know why, they just don't want to. But Buddhist culture are always bowing to each other, Gashoi. That's a very Buddhist culture, uh, Buddhist uh, cultural practice. Why? It's showing that I have no aggression to you. I'm showing I don't have any weapons. I'm acknowledging your Buddha nature. Also, it's defense as well. You can defend yourself. But this is the idea of respect your nature equally. Do no harm. So you can see and understand that's why you practice. We transmit Buddhism through culture as well. So therefore, you may think, oh, Sensei is teaching Japanese culture. No, it's Buddhist culture. Because even the Japanese tea ceremony, they call it Japanese tea ceremony, but actually it's a Buddhist tea ceremony. Japanese flower arranging is not Japanese flower arranging, it's Buddhist flower arranging. That's where it all came from. Offerings to the Buddha, that became Ikebana, flower arranging. Offering of tea, that became uh, Chanoyu, the practice of tea. All of those things were different expressions of how to be considered. Consideration is a huge part of Buddhism. That also means like a purification, cleaning. That's a kind of consideration. You know, with my children, one thing is like a, they used to say, I didn't pick that up. That's the, Mina did that. So Maya won't pick up. But actually as a Buddhist, we should pick up. We should clean for other people, take care of other people. 
But in the West culture, you say, I don't like that. I take care of myself. Well, I don't, then you are not practicing Buddhism. You're practicing self, selfism, which is fine. You have the right to do that. But Buddhists have to be very kind and very gentle to people. Appreciate, see the Buddha nature in others. That's why we do no violence. Actually, to answer your question, Michael, how should I say? Nonviolence is the basis of Buddhism. That's why the first precept is no kill. Doesn't mean that Buddhists don't kill. We developed some of the greatest fighting systems in the world through the martial arts, right? But actually, it means our, our base is uh, non killing. That's actually the founder, Guruji of the Nippon Zam Yohoji said that in one of his letters, which I, I found that that was the essential part of Buddhism, was not taking life. That's our stance. So therefore, we try to appreciate that through the entire life, preserve life, support life, protect life. Right? That's the basis of Buddhism. Doesn't mean that we cannot uh, adjust because it says in the Nirvana Sutra, you can, lay people can bring up arms to defend the Dharma. That means you can protect truth. You can protect the, 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 the Dharma. But always, if your basis for life is nonviolence, you will be less likely to commit violence. But if you don't have that as your basis, you will commit violence every day, every moment of your life, whether it's verbally, in incorrect speech, incorrect thought, like against the Eightfold Path. Because the only way you can follow the Eightfold Path is if your core is nonviolent. Okay. Um. Uh, just you were talking about um, about nonviolence as being essential to Buddhism, not only not only in action but also in word and in thought. And then I was also thinking about earlier comments you made about how do you know what Buddha nature is? You look to the Buddha. How do you know what a Bodhisattva is? You look to Nichiren. And um, although I I look at and revere uh, the writings of Nichiren that I've read so far. I also noticed that in some of his writings, he says some very, I guess by today's standards, inflammatory things about Shingon Buddhism and, and Pure Land Buddhism and Zen Buddhism and so on. And it feels very much like uh, violence in word. Um, so I'm just wondering how, if, if Nichiren is who we look to as an example of a Bodhisattva, what does that mean when a bodhisattva can sometimes say or do things that, at least in, in today's world, some of us might not quite understand or relate to or? Awesome, awesome question, because this is, again, something that I felt very disturbed about myself. So I'll tell you how, what I have so far come to understand. So Nichiren Shonen, when he made such strong comments, what was his purpose? We're saying those comments. Why did Nichiren Shonen say those things, those comments? Does anyone know? Because actually, what is the proper way to help people with, because Nichiren Shonen had one question. What is the teaching for this era, this time to teach people? What was the proper practice of Buddhism? Because in Japan at that time, tons of practices, right? And Buddhism is broken up into three, uh, uh, the true dharma, the imitative dharma, and the declining dharma. Buddha, being the genius that he is, didn't just make one teaching that was his go-to for all of those uh, times, because the Buddha knew that 3,000 years after he passed away, Buddhism would go into decline. People would become imitative. They would try to imitate the dharma. And then the dharma itself would kind of be lost, because we don't know what words are actually the Buddha's words, right? You can't tell me what the Buddha is worth. People will tell you, oh, my tradition. We don't know. No one knows. Even we can't even tell you what, how Nichiren and Shonen chanted the Daimoku. No one knows. He didn't chant it the way we chanted. So does that make it less effective? So Nichiren and Shonen was, and this is very important, 
who was he criticizing? Was he criticizing those believers or was he criticizing the teacher? That's a difference. He, if someone puts themselves up to be the leader, to have the answer, that should be able to be challenged. Absolutely. If you put yourself up and you say that you're the boss, you know everything, you're enlightened, this is the correct way, you should be challenged according to Buddhism. You should be able to be challenged and you should be able to explain yourself and, and show by doctrine and example of that all of this is true. That's what Yichin and Shonen did. So actually he wasn't saying, people take him to think that he says that Nembutsu is evil. Shingong is evil. No, no, actually not. Yichin and Shonen studied both of those methods. He was saying the incorrect use of those teachings, the misunderstanding, the ignorance, which ignorance is the root of the three poisons, right? Brought about by those priests are incorrect. And there is actually a saying in Buddhism, if you understand correctly, you must admonish <laughs> people with friendship, with a kindness. But that's how Nichiren and Shonen admonished them. And also he debated them. That's a big part too is that they, were, they should have been able to debate him, but they, they did and they lost. So therefore he was challenging himself because as we know in our culture, debating is a very important aspect of understanding it yourself, right? And go, oh, I just understand it. You got to put it to, to work. You got to challenge it. Even sometimes taking the opposite side. Yichin and Shonen did that, but you know, actually he never criticized the lay people. He was extremely kind. There's even a story about Nichiren and Shonen that there was the older woman that was chanting the Nembutsu and she wanted to become a practitioner of the Lotus Sutra on her deathbed. And she said, please be my teacher, teach me the teaching. And uh, Nichiren and Shonen chanted the Amida Butsu to, to with her as she died. Because it wasn't about him. He was able to teach according to, and then he was very gentle and kind with the lay people. But this is the idea of, what do you call that when you think on somebody, what do you call it, heroism? Like a heroism? People take on, that's why people, you know, you know how do you say, lots of different groups justify bad manners and bad behavior because they think that's what Nietzsche and Shonen did. So they'll criticize even cursing and swearing, just telling you that you're no good, right? Shakubuku type thing thinking that that's in the image of Nietzsche and Shonen, but that's just pretending because they don't have the understanding or context to, to see that. Nietzsche and Shonen actually was hesitant to do that because he knew if he did that, he would have lots of trouble. And so he did his whole life. But he also had the, the idea, it said, to, to rely on the teaching, not on the, the person. So therefore the Buddha tried to bring back according to what the Buddha's true mind was. So therefore, that was towards other priests. But he wasn't saying Shingong was evil. He wasn't saying Nambutsu was evil. Those are all Buddhist practices. The way that they were being used, the way that they were being taught, again, if you look at the Lotus Sutra where it says, causing all living beings to attain enlightenment quickly, he was talking about the idea that what is the purpose to build yourself a religious empire or a sect? Or was it to teach the teaching of the Buddha? What was your top priority? For a lot of priests, it was maintaining their sect. That's why Nichiren and Shonen fought hard against the dogmatic stance of other Buddhists. So I don't think as regular people in these days, we can understand such a thing because I think most of us are cowards. We wouldn't be able to do that. That's why we're kind of fearful. That's why we think just a cuddle other people and don't have any dialogue or debate or discussion is, is healthy. I don't think so. It's not healthy for Buddhism. It's not healthy for us. It doesn't allow us to ask ourselves the hard questions. It doesn't allow others to challenge our question, our beliefs. And if it's done, as the Buddhism says, a good spiritual friend, if you can have that conversation with a good spiritual friend, every time I do that, even with my students and you guys too, I learn something because I'm always challenging my dogma, right? Because we all have our personal dogma. I don't care for that. It doesn't mean anything to me. If I had to give all this up tomorrow, today, I don't care. Because actually, 
What I care is uh, the enlightenment of the Buddha. This is a vehicle for me. But if it's incorrect, I wish to be admonished. That's a compassionate thing you could do for me if I'm wrong. But if I can help others, I should admonish them too. That's what Nietzsche, it's a very kind act because you put yourself out there. To be honest, to put it, he really put himself out there. If people looked at it that way, they would say, man, that's, that's awesome. Because I don't know if I could do that. I'm too scared, I think. I don't know. I try. I mean, I'm loud mouth and difficult and all that. And I tell people what I think because I really believe in Buddhism. Maybe that's the good thing. I think that's the only good thing I have in my character is the kind of I, not so bright, some stupid part, but actually, one thing is I only care about enlightenment. So I don't offend or think about, oh, why people don't respect me or like, no, I don't care. Doesn't matter. I can continuously do that. That's why Skomoto Sensei will constantly, most people would leave the temple, give up. But because maybe I was too stupid and I had this pure idea, to me, I realized I would rather have that than intelligence or anything because I was able to sustain that I kept going towards and I keep going towards the, the kind of uh, enlightenment. I didn't give up just because someone made me uh, upset or told me I was stupid or something like that. I only valued unsurpassed enlightenment. I still do. That's still my biggest value. So yeah, it takes a lot of bravery, but I think that's why you are studying, you go, you study Judaism too, right? So you should do that. There's nothing wrong with that. And then little by little, you you have a connection with Nichiren Buddhism. You don't know why, but you do. So therefore, that way you should understand more. But don't be afraid to just, I have to accept Nichiren Buddhism or I don't accept Nichiren. No, it's not that easy. You have an affinity with the Buddha. Keep going. Fall down, come up get in trouble, people like, don't like, doesn't matter. Thank you. Ah, you're welcome. So that's why, be careful everyone, I always tell people, it's it's an insult to Nietzsche and Shonen to pretend that we're gonna be like him, the heroism that people do, because we don't have any context or understanding. What we need to do, what Nietzsche and Shonen wants us to do is see the truth for ourselves. See the truth in our life, to actualize Buddhist practice like he did. What gave him his fearlessness? What allowed him to be the most hated person in all the nation to bring such a wonderful teaching? Not that easy. And to be able to survive it and die a natural death. That's another important thing. Many people have great revolutions but die suddenly or, or unexpectedly because of kill, being killed or something. Nichiren and Shonen lived to his uh, death, natural death. Even though he was the most hated person in the world. That proved that he was a great uh, true practitioner. So actually, I told Skomoto Sensei one time, what was it? I said, Sensei, you know, lots of people are against and don't like the way I teach and, and all of that thing. And he said, oh, that means Kanji, your teaching is correct. But if you think about it, you probably joined Buddhism because you want to fight, you want people to like you, right? And be a nice person, a likable person, rather than what we think we are or a better person. But actually, uh, that's not the importance in Buddhism. Enlightenment is. That's the only way we can truly liberate ourselves, not by becoming a nice person. Nice person is usually other people's standards or cultural standards. But when did culture or other people's ethical standards enlighten us? Did it? But that's how we run. Most people, regular people run their life, but we have to we have the essence of Buddhism, that that's what we make our foundation. In. That's the only way I can preserve my life, to be honest. Even religion is sometimes too convoluted to understand. And then you can practice it all your life and something missing. But Buddhism, even with your Judaism, can support that your culture as well, easily. Ah, now I can, one thing about Buddhism that is really wonderful that I experienced was I can go into any spiritual tradition and see it as it is and feel happiness, feel positive and feel uh, some benefit. 
I don't need to distinguish from Buddhism because Buddhism is inside, Buddha Sutra is inside. So, any spiritual place I go, any spiritual book I read, the Buddha is there. 